Having looked in the last section at your anatomy, we're now going to look at how that is put to use in producing speech. In order to do that, we will devise a three-stage process because essentially there are three stages involved. Firstly, you must initiate the air on which speech is being created. All sound is carried on the airways and we have to make air in order to make speech sounds. And so we'll look at how the airstream itself is created. Then we'll look at how the larynx is involved in creating speech sounds. Uh, the larynx is a very important instrument essentially in creating speech because without it it's very difficult to speak at all as we'll find out when we look at phonation. Finally we'll look at articulatory processes and they involve looking at the area above the larynx, basically at your mouth and nose, and looking at how you can modify the sound made by the larynx in uh, various ways to create various kinds of speech sounds. So how do we get the airstream on which speech is carried? The answer is that we do it in the uh, exact same way as we normally breathe and we do it when we're breathing out. Try for a moment speaking when you're breathing in. It, it sounds terrible and in fact uh, you can't keep it up for very long. It's very difficult to speak on an incoming airstream. We breathe out and that's how we make sound. And in technical terms this is called a pulmonic airstream, that is it the air comes from the lungs and it's egressive, that is the air is going out. Not all speech sounds are made that way. Uh, clicks, for example, which are used in some southern African languages, clicks like and they are made with the air coming in and the air doesn't go into your lungs, it only goes into your mouth. Essentially you suck the air into your mouth and release the suction through your tongue. Well, those aren't pulmonic, They're, they are oral and they are ingressive. So there are oral ingressive air streams, but they're not used very often. We then get to phonation, which is primarily the function of the vocal cords in speaking. We looked at the vocal cords in some detail in the anatomy session, and we said that the vocal cords are a valve initially, they were a valve for stopping food from going down the wrong way and also a valve to prevent uh, the muscles of the chest from collapsing the whole of the chest when you're doing heavy work. They have an open position. When they're in the open position, air can get into and out of the lungs and so in normal breathing the valve has to be open. It can also be completely closed. That happens when we're doing heavy work, lifting heavy weights, and also in some situations when we're speaking. And then there is the intermediate position which is used for creating voice. Let's just define uh, the glottis for a moment, which is another one of the words that you haven't met before, but uh, one of innumerable words that you'll come across. The glottis is the opening between the vocal cords. If there is an opening, then that's the glottis. So the glottis can be either fully open or it can be slightly open. You can adjust the position of the vocal cords in various ways to create a greater or smaller gap between them. And here's a diagram of various ways in which the two little arytenoid cartilages at the bottom, which we looked at previously, can be hinged. In position A you can see that uh, the arytenoid cartilages are in their neutral position with the vocal cords attached to the top of each one and also attached to the top of the cartilage uh, which has got the A label on it and when that happens you can breathe normally. If you pull on the bottom parts of the arytenoid cartilages and pull the vocal cords apart, then you can create a bigger gap, a bigger glottis, 
to allow more air to get in. And of course when you're doing heavy work you need more oxygen therefore you need to open the glottis wider to get more oxygen in. It's a bit essentially like a, a turbocharger in a, in a carburetor. Um, more air in means you can burn faster. In diagram C you'll notice that there's a very small bit of glottis left at the bottom. Uh, it's a tiny little hole really and when you do that um, you can actually create a bit of a hissy sound because it's quite a small aperture and when the air goes through that you're essentially whispering. If you whisper it's actually the hiss of the voice that's coming through this very small gap left over when the arytenoid cartilages are closing. In the case of D the arytenoid cartilages have slightly turned over on themselves as you can see and it looks as though position D actually has complete closure but in fact the cords are slightly uh, relaxed and that enables air to go through between them under pressure of course when you're breathing out creating vibration. What does this vibration sound like? It sounds very much like a mouthpiece on a brass instrument. Sort of like it's not a very beautiful sound at all. It's just a, a vibration as though you're pushing air through between your lips. Um, it's a raspberry essentially. Well on the basis of that sound all voiced sounds um, are created. That is the the source of voicing. Voice itself is not particularly beautiful. It's only when you stick the mouthpiece into a brass instrument that the brass instrument can sound halfway decent. So how can you tell whether you're using your vocal cords? We're supremely unaware of most of what we do. Well there are some nice easy tests that you can use. Hold the front of your larynx between the thumb and forefinger. If you put them on either side of the larynx you'll find two little flat areas. If you hold on to that and make a voicing noise you'll feel the vibration. Right? Try it. Say ah as you would at the doctor. Ah and you can actually feel the vibration. Those are your vocal cords vibrating in there and you can feel them through the tips of your fingers. The second thing that sets voiced sounds apart is that you can make a note. The R that you make at the doctor can be made low, R and high, R, 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 R. You can R on a whole um, scale. Most people can manage at least an octave and a half. Well, anything that has a note is voiced because the vibration of the vocal folds, or vocal cords, vibrate at a particular frequency and that determines the note that uh, the uh, voice is running at. Okay, let's try it. Put your thumb and forefinger either side of your larynx and ask yourself which of these is voiced? The E in C. Right? If you say it slowly and go C, you'll feel the vibration on E. There's a vibration there. What about the I in pi? Pi, pi, yep, there's vibration there. And what about the, whoops, the Z in bays? Bays, yes, there's vibration there. It says it's an S, but it's actually a Z. It's being vibrated. There is voicing there. What about the S in soya? So, no vibration. That's not a voiced sound. The f in leaf, no vibration, not a voiced sound. The sh in shout, no, but the owl straight after it, shout, suddenly, there they are. The vibration is turned on and the owl bit is voiced. So those are two easy ways to tell. Can we do an octave? E, 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 yes, but can we do s, s, you can't sing an octave on s, the S in Sawyer, so it's not a voiced sound. Those are two easy tests to use either 
Is the larynx vibrating? And if it is, can you do a note? If the one is true, the other is also true. So long as the vocal cords are vibrating, you can sing on that note. If the vocal cords are not vibrating, then you can't produce a note.